Hello and welcome to Inside Out, a show we focus on individual stocks with in-depth analysis, deep dive into financials, and tell you about the key risk and triggers going forward. Hey, Sonal. Hey, Nigel. And not only that, right, we'll also put spotlight on the uh, metrics that Nigel just mentioned. We'll also ask the questions you want to ask. So let's not waste any time and get to our first talk today. Nigel, what do we have on Deep Dive today? Well, on Deep Dive today, we are focusing on an auto ancillary company, and that's Minda Corporation. Well, the stock is in our, on our focus list. In 2022, it's up closer on 10%. But from the highs that we saw in April, well, it's down closer on 25%. Though in the past one year or so, even after the correction, it's still up roughly around 43%. Minder Corp has a presence in the global automotive industry and is a manufacturer of automotive components for the OEMs. Now, the company caters to passenger vehicles, commercial vehicles, motorcycle and scooter off-road vehicles and tier one manufacturer in India with presence in the overseas market as well. They also cater to the aftermarket and electric vehicle space. The company manufactures many auto automotive components like electronical and mechanical security systems, die casting, keyless solutions, starter and alternator motors, telematics, wiring harnesses, as well as other sensors and interior plastics. They also boast of clients across categories from two-wheelers, commercial vehicles, off-highway uh, vehicles, passenger vehicles, and other markets. Well, the company has made an entry into the electric vehicle space as well. And these include clients like Ampere, Hero Electric, as well as Bajaj Auto, among others. Okay, so interesting names out there, right? So, now to tell us more, give us a breakup in terms of their geography, geography as well and markets and division-wise revenues, just to give us a sense of the business. Well, India has bulk of their revenues, with some exposure to America as well as Europe. Now, bulk of their revenues are from the two- to three-wheeler space, followed by commercial vehicle market, and then passenger vehicle market. They claim to be the market leader in the two- and three-wheeler lock set and wiring harness business, with more than 40% and 30% shared in the domestic market. Additionally, they are involved in keyless entry solutions for two-wheelers, better control over quality in lock set with their own die casting division. The company says they are moving from mechanical cluster to incorporate the latest technology of digital cluster. They are one of the key players in the two-wheeler and the CV market and off late, they are also getting some traction in the PV space. They have also secured large orders from thin film transistor cluster from key PV OEMs. Now, in die casting division, focuses on niche products which are margin accretive. Okay, so that's a long list in terms of focus segments. But they've also been preparing for a transition from IC vehicles to EV vehicles, and that is something you spoke about. They've been building on technological capabilities here as well. Also, how does the kit value per vehicle shape from engines to EVs? Well, that's an interesting point, uh, you know, Sonal. The company has been looking at strengthening their technological capabilities by forging new alliances. And in the past 15 months, they've acquired 26% stake in a company for EV battery charger. They've also acquired stake and signed a technological license agreement with Stonebridge for cluster and sensor. Now, in the past two months, the company has signed a TLA with uh, a couple of companies for advanced driver assistance system and a TLA with Lokonav for uh, telematic software solutions. Their focus now is to transform the current business lines as per technology trends and they claim that most of their products are electric vehicle agnostic. As the charts suggest for you on the screen, the kit value can increase substantially from ICE vehicle to an EV vehicle as the content of information and content system goes up as well. Well, a lot of segments, right, Nigel? But it's all about the numbers at the end of the day. Tell us how has their financial performance shaped up so far? What is their strategy to ramp up their business? And also wind it down with the valuation of the stock. Well, let's take that piece by piece then. In terms of financials, well, they have continued the growth momentum with the highest ever quarterly revenue reported in the past quarter. And as the chart suggests, well, the revenues have been steadily improving as well. Margins, well, they've hovered in that vicinity of around 10 and a half to around 11 percent odd. They also have a clean balance sheet with debt currently under 100 crores. Now, they've laid out various strategic pillars of growth, which include focus on enhancing the core, innovation and technology, electric vehicle growth opportunity and strengthening their passenger vehicle offerings. And as you see on the screen, well, you can also see that valuation wise, 
Well, in comparison to its peers, well, it's relatively stable or relatively more attractive. Trades at a bit of a discount to some of its larger peers. Well, to understand more about the company, we are joined by Mr. Akash Minda, who is the ED of the company. Well, Akash, first up, there was a supply side issue on the semiconductors front, which affected your performance in the past quarter. Is that sorted? While we are still navigating the challenges arising because of the subdued growth in exports and semiconductor supply crunch, the second quarter of uh, financial year 23 witnessed a turnaround in domestic consumer sentiments with pent up demand across vehicle segments on both year on year and sequential basis. In quarter two FI23 actually saw an uptick in domestic demand growth uh, across segments by improved consumer seg uh, sentiments. Moving forward, the industry growth is expected to be led by easing supply chain uh, situation as well as premiumization and new vehicle launches. Uh, better realization of agri-produce uh, could lead to higher rural demand. The semiconductor issues was mainly due to spot buying and again capacity issues at the semiconductor manufacturers, which resulted in sudden increase in demand uh, from some domestic uh, you know, customers. We are now working towards long-term contracts in, with suppliers to ensure both better availability and better pricing and closely tracking the demand from our customers to, in order to maintain this. Mr. Minda, give me a sense of if there has been any slowdown in any segments of business. Have order and flow slowed down? Is that something that you're seeing across the business? Um, see, uh, owing to the improved domestic customer sentiment, the overall business performance has been consistent for Minda Corporation. Uh, in fact, in the last two quarters, uh, this year we witnessed continued growth momentum with highest ever quarterly revenues uh, for Minda Corporation. We cloaked uh, double-digit EBITDA margins for nine consecutive quarters on sequential basis. Uh, Minda Corporation's overall growth in quarter two has been 28% year-on-year, which is much higher than the industry growth of 12.5% um, at an average. Uh, the order inflows remain very steady. The new order book is to the tune of about 4,000 crores if lifetime order books in the first half of the financial year itself. The quarterly order book, uh, booking rate has been consistent since past few quarters and overall new order book is status is also very healthy. Uh, electric vehicle mobility platforms and customers contributed about 18 to 19% of our total book uh, or total order book in uh, H1 uh, FY23. And this indicates that we are well positioning ourselves with the growth as well as in the electric vehicle growth market. So yes, order book continues to remain a very strong and healthy for Minda Corporation going forward. All right, Akash, two wheelers are a large part of your business. Now, post the festive season, there was some kind of weakness in the industry. Are production and demand trends coming back strong? If you could give us a sense, compare this December with the past December, how good is it? I think great question, uh, Najil. Again, yes, uh, definitely. Um, if I compared last year to this year, um, it's slightly better. I would not say they are, uh, you know, uh, it's it's greatly uh, better. But other segments are doing much better than the two-wheeler industry. Exports continue to uh, be a little subdued, uh, especially from the two-wheeler side. But yes, domestic uh, market from the two-wheeler perspective continues to uh, continues to grow year on year basis. And uh, but yes, definitely we've seen a slowdown after the after the festive season. So, Mr. Minda, can you give us some insights into your revenue mix and margins that you get right now? Is there a margin difference between aftermarket sales and exports? And if yes, how much is it? Um, exports definitely have a higher uh, contribution and, and profitability, uh, as well as the market uh, aftermarket uh, business uh, compared to the OEMs business. But uh, what we are trying to do is maintain the right mix of our revenue stream, our revenue segments, our business verticals, and the and the uh, uh, end segments which gives us the correct uh, mix for our growth as well as the profitability. Export margins are better then. What is the ideal mix between domestic and exports business then? Really, would, you would like to increase our uh, exports market. We are currently doing about 10 to 12% of our top line. Uh, we would now move it to uh, gradually to about 20% steadily and consistently. That's the most important part. So we would like to grow from 12% to about 20% in the next, uh, next uh, a few years in the midterm to long-term racing. Okay, so now you're going at 1100 crore per quarter. What does it mean on the capacity utilization parameter for you? What is it currently? So our overall capacity at the group level is about 70 to 75%. Of course, different plants and different uh, product segments uh, have uh, different capacity utilizations. So a uh, die casting plant will have a different capacity utilization compared to a, a wiring harness division or a keyless 
or a cluster division. But on an average, uh, put together, it's about 70 to 75%. So uh, we are coming up with uh, new plants because when we reach to about 80 to 85% of our capacities, we do plan to de-risk and uh, come up with new plants. We're also looking at consolidation of our plants uh, to get better economies of scale and uh, increase the size of the plants in order to service our customers better. So yes, the overall capacity as well as consolidation along with the growth and setting up of greenfield and brownfield projects is, our, is in our uh, radar. All right, Akash, wiring harness is nearly a third of your business. And the focus was on higher localization. So give us a couple of numbers. What is it now and where do you see it scale up to? So currently we're importing about 70% of our overall uh, components in wiring harness domain. These are primarily products like uh, connectors, terminal junction boxes, etc. Uh, the, the import percentage from India Corporation is also in line with the overall industry trend. Uh, we are working towards localization of all of these components. Uh, for this, uh, Minda Corporation has set up our own in-house component division. And overall idea is to internalize these components in our, uh, in our division for the localization and make in India. Uh, we are building teams and infrastructure in all domains related to component design, development, manufacturing, and tool design and support. Um, currently, in-house component division is supplying about 10% of our total uh, requirement. But in the next six to eight quarters, we plan to uh, uptake this with our own internal connection systems. So definitely, which will improve our uh, profitability as well as our own local connections in the Indian market as well. Okay, let's talk about the exciting part of the business as well. What about your electric vehicle business? Say by FY24, what is the targeted revenues from this segment? You know, Minda Corporation is well prepared for the electric vehicle opportunity. Uh, more than 95% uh, of our revenue comes from the products which are IC to EV agnostic, uh, which means that when the EV comes in, all of our products are going to go through a premiumization and electronification, which gives significant headroom for us for quickly scaling up in the EV segment. Um, on the kit value per se, uh, our product lines, currently we are about four to 5,000 5, uh, rupees per two-wheeler kit value. Um, but when you move into the electric vehicle mobility, all our products will offer about 16 to 20,000 uh, rupees of kit value. Again, um, we are engaged with various customers to keep our business strategies aligned with future plans and proactively prepared to deal with the dynamically poised industry. Uh, we are innovating a lot of products uh, from in-house and through partnership uh, through our technical center to keep coming up and being ahead of the industry for the products such as DCD converters, battery chargers, motor controllers, etc. On the uh, revenue front, uh, electric vehicle mobility or the customers this year uh, should be giving about 50 to 60 odd crores uh, in our top line. But next year, we plan to take it to about uh, 150 odd crores uh, in, from the total top line. Again, based on how the electric vehicle mobility uh, shapes up and how the uptake in demands happen. Let's move from the PNL then to uh, the balance sheet. Your net debt seems to be under control at sub 100 crores. But where do you see this number headed? You're talking about increased capex spend. You're also expanding in new, various new segments. So where's this number headed? We have very, very strict financial controls in place with very high financial prudence, which gives high emphasis on all parameters related to leverage. Uh, the capital allocation at the group level is very, very uh, strict and monitored right from the top and the board. Uh, our long-term borrowing uh, as of H1 FI23 is only 66 crores which is down from 85 crores as of FI22 end. Uh, this also would be rapid uh, repaid uh, as per schedules. Also, our organic capacity expansion would be primarily funded from internal cash accruals. The working capital requirements are in absolute in line with our huge growth that we are witnessing. On um, uh, Typically, we spend about 4 to 5% uh, of our uh, top line as, as depreciation, and that's what we uh, invest as well in various uh, uh, capexes. Uh, about 2 to 3% goes into the R&D or technical expenses. About uh, 2 to 3% goes into the uh, future-related technology and future-related uh, products and plants. And uh, remaining about 1 to 2% is going to about uh, replacement CAPEX or, or uh, the continued uh, maintenance CAPEX. Okay, so got that. A lot of numbers that you gave us here. But you also mentioned organic plants. But there is a buzz that Mindacorp could be looking at some inorganic plants as well. See, absolutely. I like to first focus on the organic growth. Um, as a Minda Corporation, we would like to uh, grow 10 to 15% ahead of the uh, industry. 
So let's say if industry is growing six to seven percent, we would like to typically grow at uh, about fifteen to eighteen percent, or even twenty percent growth ahead of the industry. Uh, organically, this would uh, be you know fueled by four prim primary areas. One is the premiumization of our product lines. Um, second is of course the new markets such as exports and aftermarket. Uh, third is uh, adding new and new products in different segments, particularly in the four wheeler space. Uh, and fourth is electric vehicle mobility uh, that is going to fuel the growth and the elect uh, electrification and the electronification, uh, which is which is happening. Um, so this all should be leading to about 10 to 15 percent growth uh, on the organic front. When I speak about the inorganic front, of course, we have, um, uh, you know, huge aspirations in order to grow faster than the industry. We have uh, been in discussion with a couple of potential players uh, for partnerships as well as for mergers and acquisitions. There are obviously a lot of opportunities on the table. We keep evaluating and, and uh, exploring what, we, what fits the right uh, to Minda Corporation strategy. Uh, we have clear norms internally of what we will do and what we will not do um, in terms of uh, growing. But mostly important, it has to be in synergistic areas of what currently Minda Corporation does and the electric vehicle mobility. So all of this put together is uh, our plan for uh, the growth as well as on the inorganic front. And this is how we're going to fuel uh, the Minda Corporation growth for the next uh, midterm to long term. Well, before we wind down then, Akash, what is the outlook on margins, which I dipped to single digits, but now it's back to double digits. So what's, what's the broad range we should work with? Most important, Nigel, is for us uh, to give um, consistency in our results and uh, grow sustainably on these numbers. So uh, if you look at the last uh, nine uh, quarters, we've been successfully uh, giving double digit numbers and growing quarter on quarter sequentially and year on year basis on account of uh, top line and EBITDA numbers. And now um, uh, in the next midterm to uh, long term, we would like to grow sustainably uh, to about 12%, uh, sustain at 11% and then grow up to 12% and then grow higher. That's our objective, how we would like to stay ahead of the, ahead of the industry. All right. Thank you, Mr. Akash Minda, for joining us, telling us all about your company. That was a deep dive into Minda Corporation. Nigel, thank you for explaining that to us. But it's time to slip into a short break. We'll come back with another interesting stock. Newland Labs is in the spotlight on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're tuned into Inside Out here on CNBC TV 18. Well, it's time for our special spotlight segment. Sonal, What's the company you're tracking? And give us a brief background as well. Okay, so today I'm going to be focusing on a farmer named Nigel. We've not spoken so much about that sector. And I looked at Newland Labs this time. Stellar set of quarter two performance. And that got me thinking, what does the company really do? Now, the stock saw stellar returns from Jan 2020 to May 2021, almost 500%. And from those levels, the stock has fallen by around 38%. The company is primarily into manufacturing of active pharmaceutical ingredients for global pharmaceutical companies. It also provides end-to-end -end solutions for the pharma industry for chemistry-related services from synthesis of library compounds to supply of new chemical entities and intermediates at various clinical phases up to commercial scale. It majorly has three segments. Prime API, which is 34% of revenue, Specialty API is at 30% and CMS is at 32% where Prime API is high-volume, mature products and Specialty API, that is low-volume, high-value product. And the company is focusing on tilting its business mix from Prime to Specialty in the last couple of years. Now the CMS business. It involves manufacturing API to customer specifications, designing it, developing manufacturing processes, process optimization for competitiveness and also filing of DMF for API, among the other things that it does. It has sizable exposure to global markets. North America is 43%, Europe at 41%, APAC at 5%, Japan at 3%, Latin America is there, and India is small at around 2 to 3%. It has three manufacturing units in India, all in Hyderabad. Unit 1 with 233 kiloliter capacity, Unit 2 is at 363, and Unit 3 at 305 kiloliters in terms of capacity. Well, interesting one, Sonal. So the big exposures to the export markets, and it has three segments. How has that converted into revenues as well as profits for the company? Okay, now as I said, quarter two was really strong, Nigel, right? And I looked at the past financials of the company as well. Revenues, they have seen a CAGR of 10% in the last five years. Margins have also been very strong at 19%. This is the first half versus levels of 8 to 15% earlier. And profit has seen decent growth as well. Now here, in first half, they have done 75% of FY22 profits already. 
company did say in quarter two that they have experienced some easing in raw material prices and they continue to maintain high levels of inventory to avoid any future possible disruptions in the global markets and that improvement in margins is due to shift to high margin, margin products as well. And that's what led to record high margins for the company in quarter two, 24%. And that compares with levels of 10% in quarter four of FY20, 19% in quarter three of FY21, 15% back then, and so on. So definitely the big improvement margin was the highlight in quarter two. Well, margins have been improving, but what could be the big challenge in uh, you know going ahead? And also if you could highlight a couple of risks for the company. Yes, that's what we always talk about, right? Let's start with the challenges. What could it be after the stellar performance? Now, company provides CMS services to biotech companies abroad. And they said European companies are also quite active in terms of getting some of the business from biotech companies from the Indian companies. And this could increase the competition. Also, in scaling up of chemical entities, not only infrastructure, but also scientific talent is required, right? And some of the players globally have sounded cautious on international talent. However, this is an area where they are investing a lot of time and resources. Now, risk, it would be inconsistency in offtake of APIs, pricing as well, and quality compliance risk, because these are usual risks for any of the API companies, regulatory risk, so to say. All right, but uh, we always tell our viewers, what are the strengths as well? Tell us about the possible triggers for the company from year on. And also, if you could give us a sense about valuations and promoter holding as well. Yes, so a lot of questions. So let me start with their strengths. The company recently mentioned that while European companies are getting into the CMS business actively, European API companies and the Indian API companies, they will become key supply base for pharmaceutical markets across the globe after the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And their active CMS projects, they have been increasing continuously. Quarter 2 at 87 versus 68 that they saw the last quarter as well. Company also expect, uh, expects H1 momentum to continue in H2 as operating leverage kicks in. Now, valuations are at an industry average of 22 times FY23 EPS. But promoter holding is low at 36.22% as per the last available data. So that's not very motivating for the investor. All right, it was an interesting piece, Sonal. Thanks a lot uh, for that. But uh, you know that was some information that Sonal put out for us on Newland Laboratories. But we have completely run out of time on this episode of Inside Out. From Sonal and myself, it's goodbye. But do write to us and tell us the companies you want us to discuss and you want to hear about. And we'll feature these on our show. Thanks a lot for watching.